there's actually positions of the body that make the body very energy efficient. That is, the body should be positioned on horizontal planes. Now, in a, in a little bit, I'm going to measure someone who was injured in a car accident. Um, and you can actually tell them your story, if you would. Um, who's had seizures and TMJ. And it took me about 30 seconds to diagnose why he has the conditions he has. <clears throat> now, I'm sorry, I was going to present to you a, 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 a presentation that I did in Brazil uh, a month ago to the largest dental university in uh, Brazil, the University of Paulista in Sao Paulo. And there were 600 dentists. And the, it was about the condition called chasing the occlusion. Now, the occlusion is something that has confounded dentists because it changes all the time. And so when you're in a car accident or you have, you're under a lot of stress, what happens is your occlusion will change for some mystical reason. And so they position the jaw in what's called the rum position, the rearmost, uppermost position. They actually put it back and then they adjust. How many of you had your teeth filed down, called equilibration, and things like that, to try to bring your occlusion back into alignment? So they actually start grinding away these cranial bones called teeth. To, why do they do that? Because it's a reproducible position. But what you're going to see is why that changes and why it's not a constant position. Now, this has vast ramifications in your health and how efficient energy moves in your body. So I'm just going to divide the body in, into three planes. The mid-sagittal plane, that's a plane that goes down through the middle of your body and divides it from right to left. So that means that your nose should be in line with this notch right here called the manubrium of your sternum, which should be in line with the middle of your pubic symphysis down here. And then a plane called the coronal plane, which divides the body from front to back. And I'll explain that to you. Uh, that literally, um, and I'll show you a picture tonight, or tomorrow night. I'm, sh I'm sure I'm going to have that picture so you get a visual picture of this. But literally, the ankle should be positioned underneath the knee, the knee under the hip. That this gravity line should divide the tibia, this weight-bearing bone in your lower leg, and it should pass right through the femur, this upper bone like this, and go right through your foot. So literally, your ankle joint, your knee joint, and your hip joint should be in a line. And then the line goes up through your lumbar spine, and your cervical spine. So your cervical spine should be positioned right over your lumbar spine. And then this line goes through your shoulder and through your ear. So literally your ear should be over your shoulder. So let me explain this to you again. Your ear should be in line with your shoulder, which should be in line with your hip, which should be in line with your knee, which should be in line with your ankle. Now what that means is that what should hold us up is joints and bones, not muscles. But the moment you move off that plane, for example, or you move off this mid-sagittal plane, instead of your spine holding you up, then muscles start to hold you up. And the body puts a lot of energy into what is called structural homeostasis. The reason is, is because for the body, the ultimate form of disease is vertigo. What can you do if, if you're dizzy as a biological animal? What can you do? Can you work? Can you feed yourself? No. So we have this balance center in our inner ear called the labyrinth. It's like a carpenter's bubble. Now we have nerve fibers that connect to that bubble in your inner ear all the way down to the middle of your sacrum down here. The sacrum is the center of gravity. So we have these nerve fibers that go up the lateral portion of your, your spinal column. They're called centrifugal nerves. Come out of your cord and go to the inner ear. 
Now, throughout the century, people have understood certain correlations between where our body's position and how it functions, the relationship between form and function. If you have bad form, you're going to have bad function. For example, a ger one German study showed in a 150-pound person whose head was just two inches forward off the coronal plane, there was 75 pounds of structural stress on the stomach and small intestine. So what happens is your stomach compresses. Then it's pushed down. Then it pushes down on the transverse colon. If you're there for long periods of time, it causes the transverse colon to prolapse. When it prolapses, it loses tone, which will create longer transit time for you to eliminate waste. Anytime part of the colon is detoned. So when you see people with big guts or people with concave looks like this, people who have collapsed down like this, they have prolapsed colon. John Harvey Kellogg at his famous Battle Creek Sanitarium at the turn of the century in the 19, 1915 found on autopsy of 500 people, and this is before the wholesale refinement of our foods, that of a thousand people on autopsy, he only found 75 normal colons. That number is greatly reduced today because of how we've used technology to bastardize our foods. Now a lot of things, so when a person comes in like this and they're standing there like this and they say I'm constipated, what goes through a physician's head is ah, better health through biochemistry. So I write out a prescription for a laxative and a little Metamucil. There. What does not go off in his head is, of course you're constipated. Look at how you're collapsing on your colon. You're going to have a longer transit time. It's going to take longer for material to be eliminated. Therefore, we've got to loosen that tight psoas muscle and these tight chest muscles so you can stand upright. And I can guarantee your transit time will change. Form follows function and function follows form. Simple concept profound in its understanding, profound in its applications. And it works. Now, having some understanding of form and function, uh, I'll try to show you the studies, but in 2005, there was the first study done by a chiropractor named uh, George Knutson, who put together seven retrospective study. A retrospective study is a peer-reviewed study, so it's already been peer-reviewed. And it was x-ray studies of people standing up to determine if they had an anatomically short leg. And what he found was that, are there any chiropractors in here? By the way? Uh, because if you ask the average chiropractor or the average orthopedist or the average osteopath how many people have an anatomically short leg, what they'll generally tell you is, oh, it's very low, less than 1%. It's all functional, not structural. And here's how it goes. Maybe you've had this experience. You go into your chiropractor, you're laying there, he pulls your legs down and they're uneven. So then he rolls you over, does a lumbar roll, crack, 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 pulls your feet down and goes, you're in. You're now even. Any of you ever had that experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, almost all of you. Let me tell you what's fallacious about that experience. That if he went up and measured your e kneecaps and then went up and measured these points on your hips up here on your femur, and then measure these points on your pelvis, 90% of the time you would not be even up there. When you're uneven down there and you have a leg length difference and one, one foot is longer than the other, 
you're even up there in your pelvis while you're laying down. Now the medical profession doesn't even take x-rays of you lying down. I mean standing up. They're all lying down. So they're worthless as far as determining leg length. Here's one of the greatest secrets in health about structural medicine. 90% of people walking around have a leg length difference. And that's what these studies showed. Now 40% of them is from one to four millimeters, which is considered clinically insignificant. But once it's more than five millimeters, what happens is you have a mini whiplash like this. 59.2%, that's what this study showed, of all the people walking around have a clinically significant leg length difference. So it's like a drop of water hitting concrete over and over and over again. You know what that water eventually does to the concrete? Breaks it apart. You know what it does in the human body? It creates inflammation. It creates the deterioration of cartilage in your back. It creates the unevenness creates herniations and bulging discs. It's the number one reason for hip replacement surgery. Let me tell you how that works. When you have a long leg, the long leg hits first. You have an earlier heel strike. So what happens is you go up like this and you pole vault up on that side. Now what should normally happen is that you swing over like this. But when you have one leg shorter than the other, you go like this. Now when you go like this, what happens inside is that ball and the ball and socket joint has a sideways movement instead of a front movement like this. And what that sideways movement does is grind down your cartilage. So well over 90% of all hip replacement surgeries are done on people, and this is a five-year study that I've done at my clinic, people who we found that it was too late that they, they were bone on bone. But we found why they were bone on bone. It's just like, people rarely check this thing. Now, in your life, Eric, uh, how many times do you think you've gone to a chiropractor? A lot less than I'd like to admit. I'd say 15. 15? Yeah. Okay. All the same chiropractor? Probably 11, probably 4 or 5. 4 or 5. Okay. Not bad. 4 or 5. It's a low percentage of misses. Now, I want, to, uh, I, want, I want to show you the application of this information and how easy it is to learn how to measure um, your loved ones or yourselves, and we'll have a DVD out on how to do this for the average person um, after my book comes out. The second book that will come out this year is, and it's entitled, The Most Common Cause for Chronic Pain That You and Your Doctor Don't Know About, The Short Leg Syndrome. Because you see, what research shows is that 60% of people walking around have a clinically significant short leg. Now I want to show you how just taking some simple measurements and understanding how form follows function and how physics play an intricate role in your life, whether you know it or not. Now I've devised a system to measure people in six dimensions. I want to explain those six dimensions and then I'll bring our subject up and we'll measure him. Now, so here's the six dimensions. Tilt, high shoulder, low shoulder. Tilted pelvis, high and low. Almost everybody looks at that. Not all the places they should. For example, if your talus joint in your ankle is not horizontal, if it bends in like this, you have pronated arches. And if it bends the other way you have supinated arches and that distortion works its way up your postural chain all the way to your head and it has ramifications. Rotation. And rotation is like this and there's two types of rotation. So we'll have somebody stand on a straight line and if your pelvis is rotated, the side that's forward, where it's going, you call this like for example standing like this with my right side out in front of my left, that's called left rotation. Wherever the front of the vertebrae are going, they're going to the left side, that's called left rotation. If they're going to the right, that's called right rotation. So there's 
bilateral rotation where a person will be standing there like this and their pelvis is rotating one way and then you measure their shoulders up here and they're rotating the other way. Now I can guarantee you that wherever those two forces meet in your spine, you have deteriorated disc and you have pain if it's gone on for a long period of time. Rarely are people measured bilaterally. Unilateral rotation, almost all those people have back pain, by the way, because your, spine, your lower spine twists one way, your upper spine twists the other way. Where those twists meet, there's pathology. Then there's unilateral rotation. It's actually more common than bilateral rotation. And that is this, where the pelvis is forward on one side. This would be left rotation and the shoulder is the same way. Now nature won't allow you to walk down the street like this. Because there's a mechanism in your body called the writing reflex. It always wants your eyes looking forward and horizontal to the horizon. Writing reflex. Writing reflex is described like this in Dorland's Medical Dictionary. Reflexes which, through nerve receptors in the eyes, muscles, skin, and labyrinth, resist any force to put you in a false position. What a false position is, is any time you moved off the mid-sagittal coronal and horizontal planes. So there's this mechanism, internal mechanism, that tries to always write you. If you have a hip pointer injury and it pulls your pelvis down like this, what your head will do is right itself like this. Of course, it's got to make a curve in your spine to do that. But you see, if it doesn't do that and you stand this way for a few hours, you start to get dizzy because those bubbles are not level. So the body puts a tremendous amount of energy in trying to create structural homeostasis or balance and equilibrium. With the underlining fact, keep this underlining fact in mind, it's clinically provable that 90% of us are walking around with at least five millimeters or more difference. Now, any of you here ever been offered a heel lift uh, because you're told one leg shorter than the other? Okay, now here's why I cannot conceive of any use of heel lifts. Why they're destructive, they give temporary relief if you had a short leg, why would you hike up just the heel of the foot? Because if I'm standing here, watch what happens to my body if I just hike up my heel. Anybody see what just happened? I spun around. There's a second thing that's harder to see, and that is for you ladies who wear high heels, what does it do in your pelvis? Sticks your butt out, doesn't it? Because it takes your pelvis and flexes it forward. So anytime you wear a heel, I mean, if, if you thought a person had a short leg, why wouldn't you lift the whole foot, which you should do? The problem is you can only put six millimeters inside your shoe before there's no more room for your shoe if you have a closed cover. So then it has to be built into your shoe. You have to separate the sole and the heel. I have a whole team that does this and they work in millimeters because I really find that people are even exposed to this information. But heel lifts will take away the tilt, but what you get with it after a while is rotation and additional flexion, and then after a while you get an additional symptoms. So we'll check you out to see free if you really have an anatomically short leg after we bring our subject up. I never took the heel lift, Oh, you never did? No. Okay. Now, was it based on measuring you lying down? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, then you may not even have a leg length difference. And I'll show you. I broke my femur bone, so. Ah, so it's shortened like this. I believe so, but I'm not going to check that. Okay, we'll find that out. It'll take approximately 30 seconds to make this pilgrimage. Okay, but let's first bring up our subject, and he can share with you what's happened to him. And I'll show you a practical application for this and a practical application. So tell them what's been going on. Yeah, uh, okay, this is uh, it's actually my whole life, to be honest with you, I've been pretty you know, structurally uh, out of whack. I, uh, no, and my mom's sitting here laughing, and we actually had a conversation about this last night. 
Um, you know, always being on the slender side and always being a little bit taller than everyone. My whole life, I always felt the need to kind of lean forward. So structurally, when you look at people on the plumb bob, my midline is actually, would it be the, the line that goes from ankle to... Well, if you're measuring from the side, the plumb bob should be put through your ankle because it's the least distorted position on the coronal plane. So, so it should be put through your... Uh, and it would come up like this, which we'll do in a minute, so you can actually see this. So, and I'll get back to the accent in a second. So, my whole life I've always been forward, and I also was a golfer since I was the age of four. So, you know, being, you know, an 80-pound little guy out there schlepping a 25-pound golf bag, always on my left side because it was favorable, I always had kind of a lean like this. So my spine actually almost created a scoliosis kind of form and my parents had always been told by our doctors that both my brother and myself actually were creating some kind of scoliosis because we were always leaning to the left so coming full circle here about seven years ago I was actually at a convention uh, Brian Connolly and I used to raise money for diabetes research and as you know a lot of diabetics that experience neuropathy also have you know p poor arch support and I stopped by a booth and uh, there was a podiatrist there and he put my feet on this somewhat screen and I could actually see that the only thing that would register were the balls of my feet and the tips. I had such a pronounced arch and you couldn't even see my arch. So I asked the podiatrist, I said, you know, is there anything I can do at this time? And he said, Eric, to be honest with you, no. He said, your only possible outlet is to use these supports. So hearing what you said now would kind of aid the, the forward motion that I had, but... No, there's, there's two different things. An arch support is not the same as a heel lift. So there are two different things. A heel lift is designed to raise that side of the bar. To, an arch support or an orthotic is designed to... If you, if you have arches that are too high, actually by putting an arch support in them, what it would do is weaken the arch and make it drop down. Um, so it, it, if you don't need an arch support, actually it's much easier to take the plantar fascia and muscles on the bottom of the foot and lengthen them. You can do it in about three or four treatments and then uh, you've corrected the problem instead of having to weaken your tissues. So about five years ago, I actually uh, went to massage school for personal growth and uh, I actually studied with Mark Bigelow, which was a student of Paul's uh, back in the day. He was extremely, extremely well-respected massage therapist in Palm Beach County and he was one of our instructors. And he put the plumb bob on me and I've always had clawed toes because I've always leaned forward. And the podiatrist told me there was nothing I could do about it. So when they put the plumb bob on, I realized in that moment how much I was leaning forward. So, yeah, this I is a this is a really a mystical process. If all of you feel stand up for a minute, you see, because people have surgeries all the time for hammer toes, right? Okay, because they want to correct that and they break your toes and put screws in there and stuff like this. So, what I want all of you to do is just uh, put your hands at your side like this. And then I want you to just bring your head two inches forward and watch what happens in your feet. What are your toes doing? They're going like that. Ah, hammer toes. Now that's, that's the most common reason. Then there's another reason. Take your pelvis and increase your pelvic angle like this and watch what happens. Bring it forward. Notice what's happening in your feet. So there's two, there's two reasons for hammer toes. One is that you have too much angle in your pelvis. The other is that your head is too far forward. So any time that you, you should bear 70% of your weight on your heels and only 30% on the transverse metatarsal arch. That's at the base of your toes. Not on your toes. At the base of your toes. So if you're going forward and your toes are hammering, it's because you're forward of the coronal plane. That's how mystical that process is. And that's how hard it is to diagnose it. And uh, that's how hard it is to demonstrate it, too. Okay, sit back down. Okay. So that's just the first of uh, my structural challenges. So getting back to the accident and just a little clarification, it actually wasn't a car accident. Uh, this time last year, um, I actually, from 23 until 31, which I was this time last year, I'm a long-distance runner, so I've always had this novel idea to always run my age 
every single year. So for the last seven years, I've logged quite a few miles, as you can see. Ah. So uh, this time last year, um, I started out a run, had no anticipation whatsoever to run an extended 31 miles, and I felt so good around mile 20. I said, I just intuitively don't see a 32 mile run in my future anytime soon, so this will be the last of the hurrahs. So I ran 31 miles uh, back in, it was mid-January of last year, and uh, the following Thursday, the run was actually on a Thursday morning, or a Sunday morning, the following Thursday, I woke up and physically, I felt just physically zapped. I could not get out of bed. And I'm so not familiar with that because I'm such a morning person. Always, uh, tr you know, traditionally have a good night's sleep. So I just forced myself out of bed, squeezed out a quick five, five mile run. The next morning, same situation. Woke up Friday morning, just physically zapped. I was not familiar with this. Just ran out a five mile run, got on my day, and uh, ended up going out that night with a few friends. And I just felt a little bit dazed and confused uh, the night that I went out. And uh, sure enough, two days later, I wake up in intensive care. Don't remember a thing. And uh, what had actually happened was I did poor hydration after the run and flushed uh, my cells out of sodium. My sodium dropped to about 117 and I was actually admitted into a hospital nine hours after I was left unattended. So I had a grand mal seizure is what the diagnostic was. So with that being said, um, during the seizure, I actually fell also down a few flights of steps and dislocated my shoulder. And uh, it was obviously a pretty traumatizing situation in my life, you know, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And um, the irony is, is that for the last year, I've actually really had some incredible amount of, you know, TMJ, as, as Paul and I talked about yesterday. So I've just grinded and grinded and grinded away, and I didn't realize the depth of, of what I was doing to my teeth. I've gone to the dentist uh, about three times in the last year. He said, Eric, this is insane. He goes, you are just chipping away. So he put me on an acrylic plate. So even with this acrylic plate, I still wake up after what I think is a good night's sleep and I'm so tense and I just, I have to like have a few hours before I actually have relief on my jaw muscles, so. Okay, okay. all right. That's, uh, uh, I didn't realize that. Um, so I can explain to you why, why you did that. If you take off your, sure. your shirt here. And so this is a, just a structural analysis and we're gonna measure the, uh, him in a number of different dimensions. Um, okay, so take off your shoes and socks too, please. <clears throat> okay, so let me complete the, the six dimensions of distortion. We talked about tilt, we talked about rotation, unilateral rotation and bilateral rotation. Uh, there's too much flexion, which will cause your knees to lock back. And there is extension where you're, you'll have a comp real flat back, a big kyphotic curve and your head will be forward like this. You see. A lot of people walking around like this, older people, that's an, an extension disorder. Uh, then there's projection, where the body moves along a horizontal plane. This, this force is called shearing, where the head is out, the ear is out in front of the shoulder. Or people who stand like this, where the pelvis is out um, in front of their hip, is out in front of their ankle. That's called projection. That also creates a shearing force. It creates a condition called spondylolisthesis, where the vertebrae actually start to shear off each other and compromise the cord. It creates stenosis or a narrowing of the, the spinal canal and usually requires surgery if it's very advanced, if the uh, discs have broken down. Okay, now I, I want you to just stand on a straight line. And if most of you can just move around here so you can see this, uh, this will make a lot more sense to you. You won't be able to see from the side. And what I'm going to do is just measure uh, four horizontal planes. And the first one I'm going to measure is in his pelvis. And... No, that's fine. So there's these little points on the pelvis right here. And there's the point right there, and there's the point right there. Feel me on there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I want you to just look at that. Does that look even to you? No. 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 Okay. So then I want to drop down and you have these points on your hip right here 
called the greater trochanter, and I'm going to press right down. And since he's slim, it's real easy to feel where that is. Does that look even to you? Everybody see that? Okay, this side is high? Right, okay, correct. All right. Now, <coughs> I want you to put your knees a little more together. Now, he stands with his feet that wide for a reason, by the way. Um, now, if I put my hands on top of the kneecaps, can you see that they're even? Put your feet even closer. Uh, at the, yeah. All right, I'm going to put my hands right down on the top. Is that easier to see? Okay, can you see they're even? Okay, so if they're even here, but uneven here, what does that mean? Yes, this femur is short, anatomically short. Now, <coughs> the pelvis, this could be low because it's flexed low like that. But if it's flexed low, there's a point on the back of the pelvis, turn around this way, called the posterior superior iliac spine. It would, if it's low because it's flexed low, then that point would be high on the back. Okay? Now those points are, you got to move this thing for a minute here because it obscures our measurement. Okay? So there's the point right here. Feel me on it? Mm -hmm. The bump? Here's the point right there. Feel me on it? Mm -hmm. Okay? So it's low on the front, this point, and it's low in the back. That means he's tilted. Are you with me? Okay, everybody understand that? Okay, turn around again. So he has an anatomically short femur. Now we can change this. Anybody got a book? Let's, uh, yeah, let's, yeah, that's perfect. <coughs> and that seems somewhere, well, let me just show you the rest of these measurements because uh, stand on a straight line again for me, please. Do you have to put that in there right now? Yeah, okay. <coughs> okay, now if we look at his shoulders and we're going to use this bony protuberance here and bony protuberance here, what do you see? Left is high. Left is high. Yeah. Now, so what that means is that this plane is tilted like this and this plane is tilted like this. Now, usually that means that there's more than six millimeters. If there's six millimeters, there's usually one curve, a C curve. If he was like this, his shoulders would be like this and there'd be a C curve. But he has two curves, actually, in his back. The greater the distance, the more corrections the body has to make. Now, so this is going down. The, the right side is low. The left side is high. The right side is low. The left side is high. Everybody understand that? And we know it's not, his pelvis is not flexed low. Because if it was flex low, that posterior superior spine would be high in the back, but it's not. It's low. So the anterior superior spine, this point in the front is low. The point in the back is low. That means the pelvis is tilted. Everybody understand that concept? Okay. All right. Now I want you to look up here in his head. Look straight ahead. All right. And I'm going to put my fingers in his ear and press up like this. Tell me what you see. Yeah, the left side is low and the right side is high. And I'm going to just fall off his cranial base here and fall off there and press up. What do you see? You feel me in the same place? So what they're saying is up here in his cranium, he's doing this. Right? You know why he's doing that? To get that fluid level because he's going down like this and down like this. And so what the body does is go like this, try to get him level. That's called the writing reflex. Because the body will take tremendous, has as much energy as he has, we can increase it by 50% by putting a $20 piece of neoprene in his, in his shoe. Now, in children who have growth plates before they're 18 years of old, they have these joints called epiphyseal joints or growth plates. And if you put it in and they're well nourished, and this is really interesting because well nourished children that once you get the, this level, the body starts accelerating the growth on this side. Why? Because the growth plates, it's like, you know, water always goes downhill. When you have an anatomically short leg, it will tilt you to this side. Are you with me? Once you de-load or get the pressure off those growth plates, the body starts accelerating. Anywhere from a well-nourished child from three to four millimeters a year, a poorly nourished child one millimeter a year, or no, no change. 
So we've, we've documented that over the last five years. So what you have to do every year is take a recheck x-ray and actually lower the lift. So if a child had a 10 millimeter, a whole centimeter difference, in two or three years, if they're well nourished, you could correct that before they ever develop a scoliosis or TMJ problems. Now, there was a man who started cranial osteopathy, his name was Sutherland, who said this way back in 1867. He said that the iliums of the pelvis correspond to the temporal bones of the cranium and the sacrum to the occiput. They actually have a reverse, you know, like the, your occiput back up here is like a reverse sacrum. And they function, only they have an opposite rotational axis. So if your pelvis is like this, nature doesn't allow you to flex down like this. What it will do is do this. It will right you. Are you with me? What Dr. Sutherland didn't realize is that this is a six dimensional object. This, this mechanism works in six dimensions. So for example, if you're rotated like this and these ileums go like this, what they do in your head is they ro rotate back this way. If you're tilted like this, then you'll tilt the other way up here. If you're projected down here, what your head will do to counterbalance you is project you back up here. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Are you with me? Okay, so that's what, this mechanism, we all have it. Unfortunately, health professionals don't study it. So the amount of energy he's wasting, called entropy, the amount of usable biological energy that Eric is wasting in his life is considered. Now, if we were to actually, if you've got an anatomically short leg and you decide to run 31 miles, the G-forces are tripled any time you do a high compression exercise. And bear in mind what research shows, 60% or 59.2% of the people are walking around with five millimeters or more, mostly undiagnosed until disc herniate, cartilage breaks down, uh, all sorts of distortions. Her, uh, hiatal hernias are a big example of why that happens. Also aneurysms because your, your um, aorta goes through this very thick cartilage in your diaphragm. When you have a leg length difference like this, it torques it. And every time you do it like this, the arteries have these many, many layers of muscular rings. You start to break them down. When you break them down, you develop these, these uh, aneurysms. So watch just what happens um, when we try to correct this. Now, just stand there for a minute. I just want to see. Okay, now he's not rotated here. and he's not. So he has no rotation. He just has a lot of tilt. And if you look from the side, okay, just stand there. Uh, he's very projected. You see, if we were to, here's his ankle joint. And if I were just to draw a straight line like this, you see where it goes? You see how flat he is in here because he's pushed forward. You see his knees are locked back to the max. Now I actually can get a, another couple centimeters. But you see his knee is here. It's not over his ankle, and his knee is certainly not over his hip. Here, bring your arm up. All right, here's his hip joint. Here's the middle of his knee joint. You see that? So it's a, that bowing. You can't indefinitely walk around like that with that kind of distortion and expect no anatomical breakdowns. But what it really does is it will affect your energy a great deal. So, okay, look forward. Okay, so we see that here's the middle of his shoulder and here's his ear. So there's about a two-inch difference there. Now, I want you to see how much of this changes. Okay, face everybody. $20 piece of neoprene. <clears throat> yeah, okay, let's put this underneath right there. Okay, see where those points are now? Even, right? Yeah. Okay. Pretty good guess. I'll measure the top of his pelvis. That's pretty even. Okay. All right. I'll stand from the back here and show you. Here's these points here. How's that look? Okay. Here's the ear. I'm going to press up. How's that look? Even? Okay. Here's the base, cranial base. All those horizontal planes are now even, aren't they? Are you with me? Okay. Now, I want to give you an example. Okay, let's go for, uh, turn around this way. And I want you to take a look at how much these knees lock back. See that? Okay. All right, La raise this. Okay, uh, put, you, put that down. 
Okay, now here's the middle of his, here's the ankle. Here's the middle of his knee. Do you see what just happened? Yeah, you see how if I draw a straight line now? He moved in three inches on the coronal plane. Are you with me? Okay, let's see what happened up here. All right, here's his ear. It's now only about a half an inch distorted. Fascinating, isn't it? And it did it just like that, and the body correct that because the body responds to structural homeostasis, just like that. Now we'd have to map this out and know, find the muscles that are tight that have become accustomed to this pattern. Like when you lock back like this, your quadriceps are very tight, right? We'd have to measure his pelvis. When his head goes forward like this, this stuff is tight in here. So if we, you know, just touch some of this stuff, it's sensitive up there because his head's forward and this is all shortened. But it gives you a road map back to balance and equilibrium. Okay, does that make sense? Let's see. All right. So um, um, hopefully tomorrow when we have the computer, I'll show you what the correct coronal planes are for you. Take a few minutes and review all this. I just want to take two minutes of your time and show you what these forces do to your occlusion and in your head. Everybody sit up straight, put your feet flat on the floor. I'm going to take you through each one of you, go ahead and do this, through each one of you and show you what these physical, because physical forces are physical forces and they don't care whether we, the, the laws of gravity don't care whether we like them or not. So, all right, I'm going to show you, first of all, bring your teeth together. Check your occlusion, see where they hit. Open and close them. See how your teeth hit. Okay, ready? Everybody done that? few times. Okay, take your right shoulder and bring it up two inches. Now check your occlusion. Now take your left shoulder, bring it up, check your occlusion. Okay, now take your right hip, hike it up a little, check your occlusion. Now take your left hip, hike it up a little, check your occlusion. Now keep looking straight ahead, just rotate your shoulders a little bit to the left. Keep your head forward because you won't, nature won't let you do that. Check your occlusion. That's called projection. Uh, I mean that's called rotation. All right. Now as you're sitting there, just take your pelvis and rotate it to the left a little bit. Look straight ahead, check your occlusion. Okay. All right. Now that's rotation. Okay. Now here's projection. Take your, take your head, bring it forward just two inches, check your occlusion. Not like this, just bite down, that's all. Bite down and see what happens. Okay, now bring your head backwards behind your, uh, if you see people who walk around like this with their head backwards, check your occlusion. Okay, now I want you to take your pelvis and flex it forward wherever you are, so you increase the arch in your back. Check your occlusion. Now slide down the other way, make it flat, make your pelvis go backwards, check your occlusion. There's probably not one dentist in 100,000 who knows what you know right now because they're not taught that anything below here has anything to do with your occlusion. So what they do is they use these powerful forces. A lot of these children who have orthodontic problems. They try to force these things in alignment. They want to make your lower teeth meet your upper teeth. And these forces, a lot of them have, 60% of them have clinically significant leg length difference. You try to overpower this mechanism. Okay, now I want you to do a couple other things. I want you to add some of these distortions. Put your head forward, take your right shoulder up two inches, rotate your pelvis to the left, check your occlusion. The truth always bears witness to itself. So, yeah, so yes. Uh, so, when you're in the dentist's chair, are ah, you excellent. Yeah. Let's do that. Che yeah, yeah. Check. No, no. They, 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 where do they put you when you're. Check. You sit up straight. Sit up straight. Go like this. Check your occlusion. Now, put yourself in the position you're in when the dentist fills a cavity or something, puts this little paper in there and says, bite down. That's right. You're like this. So put yourself in this position. Now check your occlusion. Is your occlusion off? Yeah. And that's where he's going to file your teeth. 
And then when you sit up, you got a different occlusion. And after you do that over and over and over again, he re rearranged your cranium. And that's the truth of the matter. That just the ignorance about, you should have seen, I went to my, uh, the Pinellas County Dental Society and I did this demonstration. And you should have seen uh, how many people turned white. <laughs> and I said, why do, you equilibrate, why do you measure people in an anatomically, because they were ignorant. They should measure when you're standing up. And you ought to be careful about filing away your teeth because they're cranial bones, right? Everyone should have an anatomical analysis because I can tell you research shows 60% of us are walking around with a clinically significant leg length difference, which does two things. It creates all these wear patterns like in his teeth, right? And what he did after running 31 miles is boom, boom, boom. Remember, every step is a whiplash but the forces of gravity are tripled if you do high compression. And as you get older, you can't accommodate. So all you got to do is have an accident or something like this. And you can imagine he's trying to run his age, wait, wait until he gets 50 and try to run 50 miles with a leg length <laughs> difference like that. I mean, he'll never do it. His body will break down. And that's why he's having seizures. Because I can tell you his atlas is like this and his atlas is spun around up here. And it twists his brain stem. So, uh, you know, I'll do this for free if you'll come to my office. We'll take an x-ray. See, what you do is you measure the, he the uh, ball and socket joints, and you have to put the central beam like this because the x-ray comes out like this. So you have to put the central beam right through the hip. You can't be where most... Uh, I was an x-ray technician for seven years, and I was taught to put the x-ray over here. And if you ask why they do that, they say, well, we're interested in spine function. But you <laughs> so what happens, it's like measuring your shoulder, stand up, so if I measure his shoulders and put my eyes down here, can I see what's, if his shoulders are level? No. So if you put the x-ray beam up here, but and not a, the horizontal beam over here, it's called a parallax distortion. It creates all this distortion because the further you get away from that, that horizontal beam, the more distortion there is. Now There's, you can see why we've invited this phenomenal man. He has so much 